Hello everybody, I'd like to welcome you back to another exciting edition of Ed Puzzle Lecture Notes. Today's objective, what are the structures and the functions of the diencephalon? Diencephalon, which is comprised or made mostly of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Definitely know the functions for the hypothalamus, because if I had to bet, I'm smelling another short answer question on your exam. So this would be a frontal or coronal section of the brain. You can see the thalamus here and here, both the right and the left. Kind of looks like a, you know, like a little orange piece of orange or a tangerine. And just below or inferior to that would be the hypothalamus right there. Now, not pictured here would be the pituitary gland, which would be just anterior and inferior to the hypothalamus, and also the pineal gland, which would be posterior, so it's not, it's not visible here, but it would be posterior to the thalamus. And just a couple more things that you can notice here. You can see that the, the surface of the brain is very wrinkly. Well, you can see there's many little shallow grooves, like right there and right there and right there. The shallow grooves on the surface of the brain and the cerebral cortex, those are called, so this would be called a sulcus, or sulci for plural. So the shallow grooves in the brain are called sulcus. Now a very, very deep groove, like this one right here, those are called fissures. And the bumps, like this, or the wrinkles in the brain, that's called a gyrus. Gyrus, or gyri for plural. And basically the same image as before. So here you got the diencephalon right down here. Thalamus, hypothalamus. Can't see the pituitary gland. Also can't see the pineal gland. Remember, here's the corpus callosum right here. This is the bridge between the left and the right hemispheres of the brain. Over here we'll have a sagittal view right here. So we have, here is the thalamus. That's what we're going over now, the thalamus. The hypothalamus will be just inferior and slightly anterior of that. Here's your pineal gland right back there, posterior of the thalamus. And of course right here you can see, barely can see purple. That's the, what's called the epithalamus. You're not going to need to know that. That's just like the dorsal part or the, the, the most dorsal or superior part of the thalamus. Mainly, you need to know that because of the pineal gland, which is right there. And we'll go over its function here in a minute. And now that we see where the thalamus is located, just superior of the midbrain, just superior and posterior, of the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Now that we know where it's at, what does it do? What is its function? What are its functions? Once again, this is writ written in red for a reason. This is the one you're most mostly going to need to know. It is a relay station for sensory information. So you got these ascending tracks, these afferent neurons, let me do a different color, that are coming in through the spinal cord and then through the brain stem they reach the thalamus and the thalamus relays it to the correct part of what's called the somatosensory cortex which is located in the parietal lobe of the brain right back here. So does the thalamus, so if, if the sensory information came from your hand, the thalamus would relay that to the precise location in the somatosensory cortex that corresponds to your hand. So each little section of this primary somatosensory cortex corresponds with a specific region of your body. So like your hands have a very big part and I can't remember where exactly the hand section is of the somatosensory cortex, but there'll be a little section of that cortex that is devoted strictly to the hand. Also the lips have a very large part of the somatosensory cortex. Now, don't freak out if you don't understand that. We're going to go over the somatosensory cortex and also the primary motor cortex later on. And it does have some other 
functions, but like I said, this is the one you definitely want to have in your notes. Underline it, highlight it, whatever you do. It does have crude perception of things like pain, temperature, pressure, but a lot of areas of the brain do that. It does it have a role in maintaining consciousness, kind of like the RAS, the reticular activating system. It does play a role in cognition, which is acquiring knowledge, but once again, things like the hippocampus and the amygdala, those also do that. So the main thing you're gonna need in your notes is this one right here. It's a relay station for sensory information. And here you have the thalamic nuclei. I'm not gonna say much on this because you're not gonna to need to know it. But you can see all the different various roles that the uh, thalamus plays, but like I said, the most important one that you need to know, it is a relay station. It relays sensory information to this little region right here called the primary somatosensory cortex and that's what allows you to feel the sensations around your body. And the different nuclei of the hypothalamus. I'm not going to go over all of them because you're not going to need to know it. I am going to point out this. Remember we, didn't, we did need to know cranial nerve number 10. That was in the previous Ed Puzzle and 10 was the vagus vagus nerve. Remember that had to do with uh, parasympathetic functions of your body, so slowing the heart rate, slowing the breathing rate, decreasing blood pressure, etc. The optic nerve, you probably can figure out what that is. That is what brings the sensory information from the eyes to the brain. Something I want you to see here is called the optic chiasm. So this is where, if you remember, in the brain stem, the decussation of pyramids is where the sensory and motor information crossed. So remember the right side of the brain would control the left side of the body and the left side of the brain would control the right side of the body. Well that same thing happens sort of here. This is where the visual stimuli crosses and some of the visual stimuli from your left eye will cross over and go to the right side of your brain and same thing with your right eye. So this is where the visual stimuli, so this is your eyes. Some of that stimuli crosses over to the opposite side of the brain and some of it actually stays on the same ipsilateral side of the brain. So if these were your eyes right here, visual stimuli that's coming from your lateral fetal view, so like out of the corner of your eye, would strike your retina right here and that information would cross over and go to the right side of your brain, the opposite side. Where the information that's in your medial field of view that's coming like from the inside, like towards your nose, that'll strike your retina here and that information will actually stay on the same side of your brain, the left side. And last little thing here, and super important. So if here's your hypothalamus, Maybe its most important role is it controls this master gland right here, the pituitary gland. So this is where big role in homeostasis, the hypothalamus together with the master gland, the pituitary gland. And now some functions of the hypothalamus. Well, first it's called the hypothalamus because hypo means under and it is located under the thalamus or inferior to the thalamus. That's why it's called the hypothalamus. The infundibulum is like the stalk which suspends the pituitary gland from the hypothalamus. Probably won't need to know that. But what you really need to know, its major function is it's a regulator of homeostasis. Now it does receive some somatic and visceral input from the organs and things like taste, smell, and hearing but it's its homeostasis or its homeostatic functions that are most important here. It monitors osmotic pressure, which is basically the water content in your body. So it makes sure you have enough water. You don't have a buildup of ions or anything else that you have the, the correct amount of water. And also, this is a very important one, temperature of the blood. So it's what, it's kind of like the thermostat. It's always checking your temperature and adjusting to keep it at a right around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, before we go into the some more various functions of the hypothalamus, 
I thought we'd take a little brain break. So, your riddle for today is, what is big, red, and eats rocks? So it's big, red, and eats rocks. See if you can figure that out. And the answer, of course, is a big red rock eater. All right, hopefully that riddle kind of woke you up because even if you've been sleeping through the first, what, seven slides or so, this is what's most important. I guarantee you, or I can almost guarantee you this will become a written question. Hey, give us, it's probably going to say, what are five functions of the hypothalamus? All right, we're going to give you six. It controls and integrates activities of the autonomic nervous system. So remember, that was the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So it regulates smooth and cardiac muscle and, and glands, which help to regulate your heart rate. So it'll speed it up, the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight, food movement through your digestive system, bladder contraction. So it controls and integrates activities of the autonomic nervous system. There's another big one. It controls the master gland, the pituitary gland. It is this control of the pituitary gland which probably gives the hypothalamus its most important function because through the hormones released by the pituitary gland which can stimul stimulate other glands, you get things like growth when HGH or human growth hormone is released. The sex organs in both males and females. The production of the female egg or ovum and the male sperm all start with hormones that are released by the pituitary gland. It also stimulates the thyroid gland, which is important in metabolism. Temperature, temperature regulation, pain relief, it's just got a ton of different functions. So the control of the pituitary gland, the master gland, super important. And here will be the final functions of the hypothalamus. It helps to regulate emotion and behavior. Now obviously it is not the only factor as far as emotion and behavior, but things like rage and aggression, pain, pleasure, sexual arousal, all partially controlled by the hypothalamus. It regulates your eating and drinking patterns. So when you feel thirsty or you feel hungry, you can thank your hypothalamus for that. Satiety centers, that basically is, those are centers that say, I'm full, please stop eating now. Uh, helps control body temperature, super, super important. That's homeostasis. Tries to keep your body at around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. So does those thermoreceptors in the hypothalamus. It's constantly mon monitoring the temperature of the blood. And then it'll send message to effectors to either raise or decrease the body temperature depending on what is needed. And it helps re regulate your circadian rhythms and consciousness. So basically your, your sleep and awake cycles, remember that is also uh, the reticular, reticular activating system that also plays a role in that. So these are the six functions of the hypothalamus. Definitely have these in your notes. You know, it's going to be a short answer question, so you're not going to have to write, you know, like a whole essay on each one of these six. But you will, know, you will have to know at least five or four or five of them to get full credit on that short answer question. And we'll make this the last slide. So we're back. I don't know why we kind of jumping around. Here's the epithalamus right here, which is the dorsal part. So remember, this is this would be dorsal, this would be ventral, and this is also superior and inferior. I always use dorsal. But anyways, all we're really going to be concerned with with the epithalamus is this pineal gland right here. And that, some of you guys maybe have trouble sleeping. It secretes melatonin, and whenever you take like an herbal supplement to go to sleep, it'll have things like tryptophan, and it'll also ha always have melatonin. So that is what tells your brain it's time to go to sleep. I do take this myself from time to time, and it definitely makes you want to go to sleep after about 10 to 15 minutes. All right, so that's the pineal gland. Releases melatonin, which promotes sleep, make makes you go to sleep. All right, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll talk to you next time.